Hello lads, I'm back. I am here to talk to you today about Doggerland. Now let me tell you a little story. So when I was in my first semester, I was in my Stone Age intro class and the teacher, she's a very nice lady, she was like, we're all gonna decide what we're gonna do our presentations and our essays on. So we had this whole chronological timeline of topics that we could pick from. It went from fucking the first, the early Stone Age in Africa, people were doing bifacial stuff, people were looking at stuff 100,000 years ago, people were looking at early Homo sapiens migration into Europe, people were doing all sorts. And it got to the last topic that I spied right at the bottom of the PowerPoint, and that was Mesolithic Doggerland. And I was like, that's mine. That's my baby girl. The moment that that was an option, I shot my hand right in the air. I was like, this I'm going to make into the best fucking presentation you've ever seen in your life. And I did. So before we do anything else, we need to have a little look at Doggerland's discovery. Now, this is delightful. Of course, we all know the classic story of the 1931 colander vision vessel that went out. This man dragged up a net. He dragged up a huge lump of peat and he was breaking it up to try and throw it back into the sea. And there was something hard in there. There was something that sounded like metal and he was clanking it and he was like, this doesn't sound like a normal shark body. I don't know why it would sound like a shark body. And he, he picked it out and it was of course the colander harpoon. Now this was clearly man-made and people were going, why the fuck is there a man-made weapon 20, over 20 miles offshore? Why is it there? Who put it there? Why have we got this here? And they kind of accepted over the next few years. There were many, many things that got dredged up. There was lots of mammoth teeth and bones. There was human remains. There was more kind of smaller harpoons and stuff and people going, right. So people lived here and now it's underneath the sea. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We're just going to ignore that because it's underneath the North Sea, which is incredibly dangerous. So we get to 2003 and Vince Gaffney is a man who's very, very interested in remote sensing. So he asks, I believe it's called PGS, a oil company, if they can give him some of their data for free because it's expensive. It's expensive. They already had it, you know, like, if a bus is going past and you think to yourself, you go in that way anyway, can you just give me a lift? You know what I mean? And he asked them, he asked them, can I have some of your data? And they said, you can only have a little bit. You can only have 6,000 kilometers squared. And he said, oh, lovely. Thank you very much. That is absolutely delicious. And so he took that and he analyzed the land and he was able to start building what the landscape of Doggerland looked like, which was lovely jubbly. So he got some funding to actually go out and do some remote sensing himself, which, it, I mean, with a big team, so not just this one man on a boat, that would be quite the feat of engineering. Anyway, he goes out and he's able to map in total 23,000 square kilometers. And eventually with the help of many fundraisers such as the NOAA and other such people, he was able to map about 45 square kilometers, which is very, very impressive. It is a large portion of the North Sea. And through that, he's found many, many features within the landscape. So we've got places like Outer Silver Pit Lake, Brown Bank, we've got Dogger Bank, we've got the Spines, we've got so many different spots within this landscape. And of course, on top of that, they were able to do some core drilling, which gives us some lovely botanical data. And this means that we were able to find what kind of vegetation we're seeing. And not only that, but we were able to see what kind of vegetation we're seeing at which time period. So, so, bear with me here. We get to about 18,000 years ago. Now, this is a very fruitful land. It's seen many glacial interglacial periods. It's been submerged beneath the sea many times before over the last one million years. And so it's got so much sediment, so much rich fertile sediment on top of it. It's fucking fantastic for growing stuff if you've got the right climate. 18,000 years ago, we're seeing the last dregs of the ice age, massive fauna. We've got kind of shrublands, no trees really. It's a bit dismal. It's a bit miserable. I wouldn't want to live there. 
I don't think anyone else wanted to either at the time. So we get to the end of the Younger Dryas. Now we're moving to about 11, 12,000 years ago. And at this point, the earth starts to warm up. Things are melting, things are getting moist. And people begin most likely following large migrating herds towards Northwestern Europe, which was previously uninhabited for a few thousand years because it was cold as shit. Now we're in a situation where this is a bustling land. It's fruitful, it's got everything. It's got smaller game, it's got rivers, it's got lakes, it's got trees, it's got Scots pine and birch spanning across the entire landscape. It is lovely. It's a bit of a paradise, one might say. So we can also see what people were eating. As it's classic with Meso and Neo people, we've got fucking hazelnuts. Of course we do. We see them everywhere, especially in the Neolithic. People actually cannot get enough of them. Well, actually, and the mezzo, I lie. They just go nuts for nuts, honestly. And also einkorn. Um, we see a lot of trade. I think there was a whole little trade network going on, and Vince Gaffney also considered that there could have been quite an extensive trade route using all of the rivers and all of the lakes and the, I guess, shallow coastal areas um, where you didn't essentially have to row into the middle of the ocean and die to transport your goods, which is you know, ideal. We don't want to drown. Now it really seems like being on the coast, being near the sea, was really really integral to the culture of these people living here. They seemed, if we look at places like Starcar and how it, they were contemporary sites of sites that would have been on Doggerland. Doggerland was still very much kicking about, it was still very much above water, and we can kind of gather a lot of information from sites that are actually not submerged beneath the North Sea. And this shows a lot of fish processing, this shows semi-permanent settlements. This shows a little bit of even artistic endeavour jewellery, things like that. And we can kind of gather that these were still collector, hunter-gatherer kinds of people, but they were settling to an extent, at least maybe seasonally. Now, how does this relate to the event that I'm going to talk about, the Storega slide? Well, people were largely living by coasts. People were largely living by lakes also, and people would have been living around rivers. And so, interestingly, we need to look at a little bit of a map of the sea's encroachment into Doggerland. So 12,000 years ago, Doggerland's still massive. It's still connecting Britain to mainland Europe. It is not seen as a land bridge. That is a concept that we are going to remove from our brains. It was just seen as a piece of land, a very fertile piece of land, bear in mind. As ice starts to melt, bearing in mind this ice is melting from the entire ice sheet that's covering the Northern Hemisphere, the entire globe is seeing a massive rise in sea level. And some people say there's estimations that this sea level was rising by one meter to six feet per year can you imagine per year in your living in low-lying lands? I can see why people in the Maldives are having problems. I would be shitting myself at that point. Anyway, so then people are being displaced. People are being forced to move more and more towards the highlands, either side. So we get to about 9,000 years ago. 9,000 years ago, we see the complete cutoff from mainland Europe, albeit it is by a small channel in comparison to today but this was not created by a tsunami. So then we need to go into our mind palaces and imagine we are sat on the coast of either Britain or the Netherlands. You decide, you decide, it's up to you. And we're sat there. The year is 8,150 BP. And you're sat there and you hear a low rumbling noise and the birds start flying away and it's looking a bit dismal things are looking a little bit unsure of themselves. And then, out of nowhere, you see a massive wall of water coming towards you and you think to yourself, oh fuck, this is not what I expected when I woke up today. And this is what we call the Storega slide, or the Storega tsunami, whatever you want to call it. And basically, what happened was there was a bit of coastal shelf off of Norway that decided one day to have a little wander into the sea. And this displaced a huge amount of seawater. So there was a tsunami that was kind of radiating out across the entire northwest of Europe. All of these coastlines were being hit. Iceland, Norway, Britain, Denmark, Netherlands region. Now, as you can imagine, 
the people that were living on the Norwegian and the Scottish coast at the time were absolutely fucked, wiped out immediately. 10 to 20 meter high waves. As you can imagine, it went up inlets, it went up rivers. Anyone that was living on some kind of body of water, I mean, maybe not the inner lakes, but the bodies of water that led out to the sea were not having a good time on that day. However, if we look lower down, if we look down south, this had actually gone down to about one to three meter high waves. So yes, it would have probably still wiped out anyone that was on the beach to some extent, but it wasn't quite as damaging when it got to, say, nowadays Kent. One other population that's probably really, really badly affected by this flood was the people living on Dogger Island. I've got to mention there is somewhat famously Dogger Island, which is a high-lying piece of land in the middle of the North Sea around this time, 9,000 to 8,000 years ago, until it does get sort of flooded out. So anyone that was living on this island would not have been having a good day that day. So there have been estimations that up to a quarter of the population in what is now Britain was wiped out by this event, but other models have said this was not quite so devastating to the population. And additionally, we have to remember, because we've already seen rising sea levels, many, many people have already been displaced, have already moved to higher lands, and so in some ways this kind of probably saved quite a few lives. I say this though, this tsunami has been estimated to equate to about the same level of force as the Boxing Day tsunami, the 2004 one, or the tsunami that happened in Japan in 2011. So it was still a very, very devastating event. Nonetheless, the sea levels were still rising and sea levels continue to rise until about 6,000 years ago, give or take. What is really interesting is we do see a cultural divide that happens after this event. So there was these things, there was these little things called trapezoid microliths and these were kind of widespread across Britain and mainland Europe until this event, until this event, where we begin to see in Britain they are no longer made. And we kind of have to assume that there was some trade going on, there was some passing of culture, there was some passing of foodstuffs, there was some passing of general goods, because we have a lot of evidence, well I say it a lot, we've got some evidence of trade, we've got some evidence of boat travel, so people using dugout canoes. There's this canoe that was found in the Netherlands, the Pesse canoe. And this was a three meter long dugout canoe made out of Scots pine. And it is, I think, the oldest ever discovered boat, possibly in the world, I think definitely within Europe. But these would have been very, very common in all likeliness throughout Doggerland. And they would have used the rivers and the lakes and used the coast to move around. So what we see in here is this coming to an abrupt halt. As you can imagine, the coastal populations were fucked for a few generations. But, but there's hope, there's hope. Within 150 years, there is evidence that people were either breeding like rabbits and they were just repopulating the coastline, or people from inland were moving back out toward the coast and the coastal populations were actually thriving within very few amount of generations, which is, it's lovely to see, but I do wonder to myself, you know, I do wonder how many stories were being told about this flood, because as you can imagine, there would have been survivors of it, there would have been people that watched it, and I can kind of see that being like a really, really traumatic major event in people's lives to the extent that it was probably passed down for a few generations as an oral story that maybe became some kind of folklore, legend. Although I say this, this is literally coming out my ass. Like I am, I don't know, but I can really imagine that being the case, which is kind of interesting. It's very interesting. I wonder what kind of language these people spoke as well. We will never know, unfortunately, but anyway, that's a whole different tangent that I'm going off on. Now, fortunately, these descendants of the people that were initially buggered and blasted by the Astoraga slide did carry on with, I guess, their traditional cultural practices until the Neolithic invasion happened and they finally had to accept farming into their lives, just like Christ. Because I really feel like these people were kind of gatekeeping their culture. I really feel as though Europe adopted farming a lot more readily and a lot sooner than people that were living in what would become the British Isles and Dogland. I think they were so reliant on the fishing industries and on their way of 
collecting, foraging, hunting, all of this, they were like, no, 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 no. You can take your iron corn. We will eat it, but you can take your growing iron corn and you can shove it right up your <laughs> And with that, I present to you the idea that Northwestern Europe, specifically the coastlines of what is now Britain and sort of the Netherlands, was the last stronghold of Mesolithic culture within Europe. I think it's also really interesting to see how industries have been sharing data. And obviously it's not really necessarily that common from what I know within especially the sharing of data between gas industries, for example, and the archeological industry. Obviously in the North Sea, we mostly have wind energy, gas, and oil firms trying to farm there. And this really fucks things up for archeologists because you're literally destroying the archeology span by doing any of those things. And there's also many ethical issues, especially with the oil and gas industries. But, but having said that, I think it's really cool that people can share data. I think, I think that's wonderful, that is. And Vince Gaffney hopes that these technologies will and are being used to understand what the geography of land bridges around the world that now submerge beneath the sea are like, which is lovely. We love to see the sharing, we love it. It's very exciting. That was a very quick rundown of everything, um, but there is a lot, lot more information that you can find. I think I will link a lot of stuff below so you can find all of the sources, well not all of the sources, but a lot of the sources that I used. Now I will have a little two minute spiel in a moment about what I was doing over the last year. It's very, very exciting. I think hopefully over the next year, I don't know how consistent I'll be with videos, to be honest with you. Um, YouTube is a fickle mistress to please and these take a lot of producing. So we will see, but I am going to be doing a lot more exciting stuff. I still have another whole year of masters to go and I think I'll be doing my thesis on cave art. So you're gonna be seeing a lot of art. Thank you very much for watching my little spiel and I hope that you enjoyed. Hello lads, so for anyone who has seen this, who's wondering what I've been doing over the past year, I have been a very busy gal. I've been, well, I'm doing a two year long masters. So I've done the first year. I've literally, I'm about to move country for the fourth time in a year. Um, I moved to Germany last October. I was there until the end of February. I was very busy. This is why I literally dropped off the face of the earth because it was great. It was fucking fantastic. Um, I met so many people. I started in Tübingen, um, which is a very, I mean, it's one of the best paleolithic archaeology departments in, I would say, in Germany. Then I moved to Italy at, on the 1st of March. I was there for four months. I went to Sapienza Uni. It was a treat. It was a lot. It was the biggest place I've ever lived. I've got so much footage from all the all the shit, all the tourist shit that I did there, which was mad. Um, I saw all of the famous sites. I'd never been to Italy before, so this was very exciting. And then I moved back to Germany um, at the beginning of the summer and I worked for two and a half months full time, which was very, very exciting. It was on a Mesolithic site, which we were the first to excavate it. I was so lucky I got employed by one of the state offices. Honestly, obviously I used to work in commercial, but I hadn't done any proper stone age stuff before so this was a very different type of dig for me um but anyway i can't really do anything on that because it's not published yet it will probably be published at some point by the office but nonetheless i am a proper stone age archaeologist now apparently um and then now i finished work and i'm about to move to france so yeah that will be an experience and a half, but we'll see. We'll see if I can continue to pump out videos. Um, I was kind of thinking of doing a more podcast situation because it's fucking so much less effort. It's like editing videos really actually takes so much time. So anyway, yeah, that's what's been happening. Um, we'll see what happens in the future. Can't promise anything, but here we are.